Hello, everybody out there in the land of the internet. Lene here. I am the instructor trainer at Magoosh, and I'm going to spend a little time talking to you about what you can and cannot assume on geometry diagrams on the GMAT test. But first, if you like this video and you want to see more, hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe to this channel so that you get all the latest and greatest from the team here at Magoosh. Let's talk about the things you can and cannot assume about geometry diagrams on the GMAT. First off, what you can and cannot assume will really depend on the type of practice question that you are working. Uh, diagrams and data sufficiency questions will allow for different assumptions than diagrams and problem solving questions. So let's start with the things that you can feel comfortable assuming for both question types. Safe assumption number one. A line that appears straight is in fact straight. This is the most fundamental thing you can assume about any geometric diagram, whether it be on a data sufficiency question or if it's on a problem solving question type. Under the same general assumption, you can assume that if points appear to be collinear, which means that they appear to be connected by what appears to be a straight line, uh, looking something like this, then the points are in fact collinear and the line between them is straight. There is no hidden curve that you can't see. There is nothing suspicious going on that you need to question. That being said, it's important that you don't confuse straight with horizontal. While straight lines are often horizontal, those two terms are not synonymous. A straight line can be straight in any direction. You cannot assume a line is horizontal just because you can assume that it's straight. The next thing that it is safe to assume on both problem solving and data sufficiency question types is that if the prompt names the figure, then that figure has all the properties of that figure type. So let's say you're given this shape and you're also told that it's a square. Then and only then is it safe to assume that the angles QPS, PQR, and RSP are right angles and that the line segments QR, RS, PS, and QP are all equal lengths. These are a few of the properties of a square that will be true because the figure has named it or the prompt has named it as a square. It's important to make sure you're familiar with the theorems and defined properties of commonly tested geometric shapes. If you're not comfortable with the general properties of geometric shapes, like the fact that an equilateral triangle has all sides that are congruent and that each angle inside of an equilateral triangle is 60 degrees or that a rhombus has four congruent sides, congruent opposite angles and perpendicular diagonals, that indicates that you need to take some time to brush up on those basic geometry factoids with those commonly tested shapes. Magoosh has a ton of resources to help you review. We have video lessons and we have practice questions with detailed answers and explanations. Those will help reinforce the geometry rules you need to know come test day. And of course, I will link some of those resources below for you so that you have easy access to them. Now let's talk about some things that you can only assume for problem solving question types. For problem solving question types, most of the figures that you see are going to be drawn to scale. The only time that isn't true is if you are told, given information that says the diagram is not drawn to scale or the diagram is not necessarily drawn to scale. You could see both those types of phrasings. Bottom line, that figure, not to scale. And now you know it because you were told it. But what does drawn to scale really even mean? Well, it means that the figure is drawn as accurately as possible, but it does not mean that it is not open to interpretation. The figure being drawn to scale is helpful when you are visually approximating. So let's go back to the figure I showed you before and we can talk a little bit about what this visual approximation means. Our old friend PQRS looks like a square, but if you are not told that the figure is a square or a rectangle, you cannot assume that the angles are all exactly 90 degrees or that the line lengths are exactly the same. And the line pairs that look like they're making up a square, they might be parallel or they might be perpendicular. They might not be. We don't have information that tells us that. For instance, angles PQR and QRS could be 89.9 degrees, 
and QPS and RPS could be 90.1 degrees. Those angles would still add up to 360 degrees, making this a quadrilateral of some sort, but that's all we can know for sure. Always keep in mind that even if you're told a figure is not drawn to scale for a problem solving question, the diagram is not going to be outright deceptive. For example, you won't see a figure that looks like a four-sided square-like figure and then later find out that figure is actually a circle. The test makers, they might be tricky, but they are not unfair to that degree. Even when it's not done to scale, you can still visually approximate angle and line lengths. So the geometric diagrams and problem solving questions are useful when you are approximating, but they're not necessarily helpful if you need to find an exact answer. And on the GMAT, for the most part, approximating is all you need to find the correct answer. If you do need to find an exact value, you will definitely be given enough information in the question to be able to determine that exact value. Again, the test makers are tricky, but they are not creating questions that are unfair. That might be debatable. Now let's talk about what you cannot assume. And for what we cannot assume, we're gonna switch gears, stop talking about problem solving questions and start talking about data sufficiency questions. So you cannot assume that a diagram is drawn to scale for data sufficiency questions. Contrary to problem solving question types, data sufficiency question figures are not drawn to scale and the diagrams will only reflect information that is given to you in the prompts. Remember our figure PQRS. If we were to encounter that figure in a data sufficiency question, it looks like a square, but we cannot at all assume that it's a square, even though it looks like one. And we have to be really careful because like with problem solving, we would use that to approximate, but with data sufficiency, we have to look at the statements to see what we need to do with the figure. If either statement one or two tells us that angle PQR, for instance, is 85 degrees, we have to accept that and either reimagine the figure to have an 85 degree angle or better yet, redraw it on our whiteboards to visualize a figure that has an 85 degree angle. Because what the given figure looks like and what the statements tell us about those figures uh, that information might paint very different images. And if you think about it, that's sort of the nature of the beast of a data sufficiency question. It makes perfect sense that data sufficiency questions are not drawn to scale because the point of a data sufficiency question is to determine if there is enough information to sufficiently answer the question. So in terms of something that looks like a square, you might be asked to prove whether or not it is a square and then the statements would either be sufficient or not sufficient in proving whether or not the figure is a square. Ultimately, the goal is to consider all the possibilities of the geometric shapes in comparison with the information given to you within the statements. Now, let's bring both question types back together and talk about things that you can never assume on either problem solving or data sufficiency question types. You cannot assume that lines are parallel or perpendicular, even if they look like they are parallel or perpendicular. The only way that you can assume that the lines are parallel is if you are given the symbol for parallel lines, which looks like this, or if you are in fact told that the lines are parallel in the information given in the question. The symbol for perpendicular lines looks like an upside down T, or you might see the square in the corner of an angle between two lines, which will look something like this. If you see the symbol for perpendicular lines or you see a box indicating a 90 degree angle, then you can move forward with any geometric theorems that apply to parallel or perpendicular lines. And finally, for both data sufficiency and problem solving question types, you cannot assume exact measurements for lengths or for angles. Although an angle might appear to have a certain measurement, you cannot just assume it is what it appears to be. Looks can certainly be deceiving when it comes to figures on these tests, especially when it comes to angles. And this assumption is most commonly made for right angles. Unless a diagram is marked with that square symbol in the corner, or you're told that the diagram has a right angle, you cannot assume 
an angle to be a right angle equaling 90 degrees. So be really careful when you come across triangles that look like right triangles. If you're not told that they're right triangles and they don't have the box down in the corner, you're not dealing with a right triangle. Similarly, line lengths may not be the same even though they look an awful lot like they are the same. For example, a shape that looks like a square might be deceiving you into thinking that all the side lengths are equal and all the angles are equal. But again, this assumption cannot be made unless we are actually told that it's a square or if the question gives us enough information for us to conclude with certainty that it is in fact a square and not just some other rando quadrilateral pretending to be a square. By now, I think you guys are probably getting the gist of what you can and cannot assume about geometric figures on the GMAT. In short, you really can't assume much of anything that isn't explicitly given to you or can be implied with certainty based on information that you are able to build or piece together from information in the prompt or within the figure itself. On test day, be sure to take your time and work carefully through any figures you encounter on the GMAT and be especially careful not to fall for any of the tricks and traps built into those questions by the ever so crafty test makers. For more information on what you can and cannot assume when it comes to GMAT diagrams and some example problems, check out some additional Magoosh resources that are listed below. As always, good luck in your continued preparation for the GMAT and thanks for watching everybody. Bye-bye.